Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pobs Sleep Stories. My name is Chris, and tonight I will be your guide as we journey to ancient Greece to hear the most boring myth of all time. The kind of tale that will make you knock out faster than your grandpa after Thanksgiving dinner. The kind of story that will give you a first class ticket straight to dreamland with lots of dull, bland, insipid scenery along the way. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to relax and find comfort in the space that we're in, here and now. Because, well, you know, we're here, and it's now, so we might as well. Close your eyes, if they're not closed already. Honestly, they probably should be at this point, unless you sleep with your eyes open, which, well, we don't judge here. But maybe keep that little habit to yourself. With your eyes closed, turn your attention to your breathing. Notice how your body feels as you breathe in, then out. In, then out. Surely you know how this goes by now. Now. Turn your attention to the muscles in your arms, legs, torso, and head. Imagine you are a certain copy-written green character with giant muscles. You know, the one that has some bulk to him. Some may say huge. Perhaps a combination of the two. Ball your hands into fists and tense your arms as much as you can and hold for a few moments. As you untense your arms and hands, notice how much lighter and more relaxed your muscles feel. If your arms had eyes, they'd have cucumber slices over them and be lying in a lawn chair in the Caribbean right about now. Now, turn your attention to your legs. Tense your legs as much as you possibly can curling your toes and squeezing your knees together until you feel like a frog leaping off a lily pad on a serene, peaceful lake. That's right, we're not just going to talk about superheroes here. After all, we are into sleep and meditation as well. As you untense your legs, feel them sink deeper into the mattress beneath you. Now, turn your attention to your torso. Take a deep breath and squeeze your abs like there's a personal trainer standing over you. Feel that tension build and build until finally you release it, feeling a wave of relaxation wash over you. And finally, focus on your head. Are you carrying any tension from the day there? Squeeze your eyes, clench your teeth together, and draw your shoulders up toward your ears. 
hold that tension until finally you release it, allowing your shoulders to drop and your eyes to relax. Now that we've taken the time to relax and find comfort in the space that we're in, here and now, let us begin our story. Picture it. You are in ancient Greece. Nearly everyone you see looks good enough to be a Greek god. Just don't tell that to Zeus or Aphrodite. We're trying to relax here, not be smote or turned into a goose or whatever else those two enjoy doing in their spare time. The streets are busy with these beautiful people. Beautiful people telling stories. Beautiful people laughing. Beautiful people visiting food stands and walking away with food we can't even imagine eating today. It's a lively scene. You're in the city-state of Ephora, which some historians actually believe is just another name for Corinth. But hey, what do I know? It's all Greek to me. And here, all seems peaceful. The city is thriving. The people are happy and fed. There is no war. The only drama they ever seem to run into is when their gods float on down to cause a little ruckus here and there. It gets boring up at Olympus. I mean, can you blame them for getting a little rowdy? And, at the end of the day, for the most part, the people of Ephora don't mind. Dionysus does throw a mean party after all. If you like wine and grapes, and old men that play horn instruments, that is. The king and founder of Ephora, Sisyphus, was the exact kind of leader this new city-state needed. He built roads, he opened up the city's ports, and encouraged commerce and trade with other places. He encouraged the people of his city to get out and explore, to learn navigation, and sail off into the sunset to see what the ocean and seas had beyond them. Pretty nice of him. Until you remember that back then, they thought there were giant sea monsters that would destroy any boat that came near them. But, regardless, Sisyphus seemed like a nice leader at first. From the outside, looking in, he was powerful. But, with power, comes a few character traits that are, shall we say, less than desirable. Sisyphus was an avaricious man. For the most part, he cared only about money and accruing more fame and power for himself. If Vegas had been around, this man would have wanted his name flashing over the strip in neon lights. But Vegas wasn't around and candlelight doesn't quite look as flashy. So, he had to take a different route to show his power and strength. Sisyphus did something a tad bit unconventional. He killed guests and visitors that arrived at his palace from other cities 
Imagine if you traveled to Britain and the queen popped out of Big Ben with an axe. That's the kind of power move that King Sisyphus decided to pull. And, for the most part, it worked. Oddly, people kept visiting from out of town, but it worked. Kingdoms all over saw the power of Sisyphus and feared the king who ruled with such an iron fist. The king who would kill anyone so much as stepped on his palace grounds. By modern standards, we may consider the man to be a bit unhinged. But this is ancient Greece we're talking about here. A little Sunday samba with a sword was as normal as grabbing brunch with friends. And so, for quite some time, Sisyphus lived a peaceful life. His subjects and visitors sure didn't. But he did. He had all the luxury that ancient Greece had to offer. He could lounge on fainting couches and be fed grapes as the sun made its lazy arc across the sky, casting warm rays on his bare skin. He could sip from cups of pure gold as he munched on dates and fine food that was brought to him from all over Greece by people who probably weren't alive anymore. He could sit out on his balcony, one of the many in his palace, and watch as the stars flickered to life against the inky black sky. There were always dozens of servants around him, bringing him whatever he wanted and needed. Cold drinks, sweet desserts, fresh, rich dishes made by his own personal cook. Life as a king was the kind of life people dreamed of. But it came with a bit of a catch. Because, you see, killing guests that arrived at his castle in order to show his power, Sisyphus was actually putting himself in danger. Because Sisyphus was violating Exania, the rule that demanded leaders show hospitality to guests traveling to their kingdom. This violation of the rule angered Zeus greatly, who slowly began to decide that he didn't quite like this king, this ruler. But Zeus, as I'm sure you're aware, wasn't quite the freshest rose in the garden. If you catch my drift, he tended to dabble where he shouldn't have. Spend some very, very quality time with people he shouldn't have, and wasn't much of a rule follower himself. One day, Zeus took the form of an eagle and flew high above ancient Greece. The wind brushed over the great god's feathers as he dipped and dived through the clouds. He was majestic, beautiful even, soaring through the wonderland, seemingly without a care in the world. With such grace and comfort in the moments where he was high above everything, sailing off to only Zeus knows where. Some people down below fantasized 
that Zeus was flying off to distant islands to lounge on beaches far, far away from his obligations. Others believed that he was drifting with the breeze, breathing in the sweet aroma of pine trees and the salty ocean air and letting it take him wherever it wanted. But Zeus wasn't flying to distant beaches or enjoying the sights as the breeze took him wherever it wished. Zeus was on his way to do what Zeus did best, to kidnap a beautiful young woman, Aegina, the daughter of the river god Asopos, was the target of Zeus's affection that day. A stunning nymph with a gentle demeanor, and many people who loved her. She fit Zeus's typical MO quite well. And so, on that fateful day, Zeus swept down through the clouds and took poor Aegina in his giant talons, whisking her off into the sky. He flew over Ephra, where Sisyphus was sitting out on his balcony, enjoying watching the world go by. When he spotted Zeus in his giant eagle form, flying over the city with a girl in his talons, hundreds of feet above the city, he sighed and probably thought to himself something along the lines of another normal day in ancient Greece. Zeus landed on an island near Attica, which he cheerfully declared would be Aegina's new home. Much to Aegina's disappointment, she had been having a wonderful day by the river, and now she had to be grateful that her kidnapper dropped her off on an island instead of the pits of Tartarus. But What Aegina didn't know is that she had a rescuer on the way. Her father, Asopus, had seen her get kidnapped by Zeus and chased after them. He followed the river using his power until he lost them somewhere near Ephira. Asopus was devastated. He loved his daughter dearly and wanted to rescue her from her unfortunate fate. When Asopus lost his daughter, he decided to take the next logical step. He went to Sisyphus, hoping that the king might have seen something. When Sisyphus heard what Asopus was there for, He was kind enough not to murder the river god. He knew that Zeus would be furious with him if he told Asopus where his daughter was. Zeus could smite him, could turn him into a bug, could make him fall in love with a bull or a tree or his own reflection. And so, Sisyphus did the only logical thing. He told Asopus exactly where Zeus had taken his daughter. Because some people, like Sisyphus, just like to see a few dashes of drama in their day. Plus, Asopus did offer to make a spring flow on the Corinthian Acropolis for Sisyphus's help. And so, Asopus followed the directions Sisyphus had given him and pursued after his daughter, 
sailing across the sea to the island where his daughter was. But Zeus faced Asipus and gave him a challenge he couldn't quite overcome. He threw thunderbolts at Asipus, giant glowing beacons of pure energy, electricity, and power. Thunderbolts that illuminated the entire sky as they made their way down to the sea that Asipus was trying to cross. This forced Asipus to give up his pursuit and head back to his own waters. Agena remained on the island where she gave birth to Zeus's son, Aeacus, who would, one day, become king of the island. Clearly, her family was a big fan of names that started with A. Just because Zeus got his way did not mean that Zeus wasn't going to punish Sisyphus for his betrayal. He had nearly made Zeus lose his hundredth, maybe thousandth lover. Something incredibly valuable to poor, lonely old Zeus. Zeus wouldn't stand for that kind of behavior from someone under his rule. He decided that Sisyphus's days were over and ordered Thanatos to chain Sisyphus up in Tartarus. Tartarus, a place worse than the DMV, worse than getting her tooth extracted, worse than death itself. Rather than be concerned about his eternal damnation to Tartarus, Sisyphus had questions. He had not been greeted by Charon, whose job was to guide souls into the underworld. He found this incredibly odd, and it gave him the overwhelming feeling that he had somehow gotten the upper hand. Thanatos led Sisyphus down into the underworld of Tartarus, bright red and orange flames licked against the cavern walls that lined the walkway to the cavern where Sisyphus would be imprisoned. In the distance, Sisyphus could hear the sounds of other beings who had betrayed Zeus calling out for help. But this didn't scare Sisyphus. Because, remember, Sisyphus was a confident ruler, a man sure in his ability, a man full of knowledge and wit, and, well, himself. Very, very full of himself. When it came time for Thanatos to chain up Sisyphus, Sisyphus canted his head to the side and made questionable, curious little hums underneath his breath. He asked Thanatos how the chains worked. They appeared to be so powerful, so unbreakable. But how was that possible? Could you show me? he asked trying to hide the grin that desperately wanted to cross his lips. Tired and overworked, Thanatos snapped the chains on himself to demonstrate how they worked. See? They are unbreakable. There's no way to escape them, he explained. Shaking and hitting the binds, to show how truly unbreakable they were. Sisyphus grinned. How intriguing. He reclined 
stepped on a nearby rock and stretched with an air of complete and total relaxation. So, you couldn't escape those binds, even if you wanted to right now. You don't have a key of any kind on you. Thanatos shrugged and happily chimed. Nope, these can't come off. And so they won't, Sisyphus replied, giving Thanatos a wave as he began to walk back out of the cavern. Realizing what had been done, Thanatos called out to the king, desperate to be rescued. But, Sisyphus just smiled to himself and continued on. Surely this wouldn't come back to bite him someday. With Thanatos, the god of death, chained in Tartarus, Sisyphus meandered back up to his kingdom and took his spot back on the throne. His wife, Merope, was thrilled to have her husband back in her arms. Even if he did murder people who came to their palace. The two lived in peace for quite some time, indulging in all the luxuries that they had. They ate grapes as they reclined on fainting couches. They curled up in each other's arms and watched the stars go by every night, painting the sky with a sparkling display of black, blue, and gold. They dined on the finest foods and drank the finest wines. And meanwhile, the world kept on turning, seemingly forgetting all about the fact that Sisyphus had been sentenced to death, but something odd began to happen around the world. People weren't dying. While the average person was relieved by this, and many considered it to be a gift from the gods, some others were rather upset by this suddenly happening, namely the gods themselves. Ares, the god of war, could not understand why his opponents weren't dying in battle. After all, that was kind of his whole deal. Furious and understanding that something was clearly wrong here, Ares stormed up to Olympus to confront Zeus about this sudden change. And, for a moment, Zeus was stumped. Furious, he called upon Thanatos, angry with him for not doing his job. What was everyone else doing while Zeus was throwing thunderbolts and kidnapping people? just lazing around, doing zilch. But when Thanatos didn't come after being summoned, Zeus suspected that something was deeply, truly wrong here. He sent Ares down to Tartarus, and when he arrived, he was shocked to find Thanatos chained, looking exhausted and relieved to have a rescuer finally come for him. If you thought Zeus was upset before, this was a whole different level. Ares told Zeus what happened. In a rage, Zeus decided to put an end to Sisyphus once and for all. He killed the king, sending him to the underworld. But Sisyphus was not an 
unintelligent man. After all, he had already outsmarted death once, and after truly being killed, he was about to outsmart death again. Sisyphus told his wife that in the event of his death, she was not to give him a proper burial, as was customary and incredibly important in ancient Greece. He ordered her to throw his lifeless body into a town square, telling her that this was an ultimate test of her love, that he would be able to see in death. Merope did as she was told. Through her tears, she dramatically tossed her husband's body onto the streets of the city he had once ruled. She expected an uproar for townspeople to be in tears, but for the most part, people meandered on without giving the body so much as a second glance. Their thought upon seeing it was almost definitely oh, another day in ancient Greece. At least he didn't get turned into a swan. As a result of not being given a proper burial, Sisyphus awakened on the edge of the river Styx and that, my friends, is where he had to put on his acting shoes once more. He traveled through the underworld until he found Persephone, queen of the underworld. She greeted him with a warm smile, since he was pretending to be in immense pain and harboring immense anger. He told Persephone what had happened to his body, that he was tossed into the streets he had once ruled, with no words said, no rights given, nothing. He hadn't been properly cared for by his wife. The person that he thought loved him more than anyone else on earth a sucker for love. Persephone was touched and wounded deeply by the story that poor Sisyphus told her. She took his hands gently in hers and promised him that she would give him a chance to confront his wife and punish her for her inappropriate behavior. She released Sisyphus from the underworld so he could go to the surface and find his wife. Sisyphus thanked Persephone, appreciating her for the goddess that she was. But as soon as he left the underworld, his tears dried up. He journeyed back to the surface over familiar roads crossing familiar bridges and making his way down dirt streets that he had created as the city's ruler. When he found his wife, he greeted her with a sour look. He told her to follow him out onto the city streets where his body had been tossed in front of everyone in the town square. Sisyphus reprimanded his wife, calling her behavior an ultimate betrayal. Catching on to his motive, Merope knelt before her husband and apologized to him, begging for forgiveness. Everyone in the city saw Sisyphus had risen from the dead. Everyone saw the way he had admonished his wife for her behavior. 
and they all believed he was even more powerful than they had previously thought. After all, he had returned from death not just once, but twice. After punishing his wife, Sisyphus was expected to return to the underworld. After all, that was the deal that he had made with Persephone. A deal that she offered from the kindness of her heart. But Sisyphus wasn't one for kindness in any form, so he decided he was going to stay on as king with his wife by his side. And Persephone was a rather busy woman in the underworld, so she didn't check to see if Sisyphus had returned to the underworld as he promised. For quite some time, Sisyphus lived a peaceful life with his wife and kids. But a man of his hubris cannot live peacefully for his whole life. Sisyphus eventually grew a bit bored of his ordinary life. He bragged to anyone and everyone who would listen about how he had escaped death, about how he was the most cunning, wise, and tricky man in all the world, about how he was even wiser than Zeus himself. Zeus wasn't a huge fan of people saying they were better than him in any way, shape, or form. This news traveled back to Zeus rather quickly, and frankly, he was rather sick of hearing the name Sisyphus tossed around. Frustrated and furious with Sisyphus for outsmarting death once more, Zeus sent Hermes to find Sisyphus and drag him to the underworld. Sisyphus knew that Hermes was in pursuit of him. He knew it would be best to hide his identity, to retreat somewhere where he couldn't be found, to take on a disguise. Unfortunately, they didn't have stick-on moustaches in ancient Greece, so Sisyphus was forced to hide by other means. He spent much of his time out of his kingdom in the woods, but traveling through the woods isn't exactly discreet. When you're bringing a caravan, multiple servants, a personal foot misuse, and a sandal shiner with you. As a result, Sisyphus was found rather quickly. When Hermes came and grabbed him by the ear, Sisyphus tried to talk Hermes out of it. He tried to use his wit to stay as ruler, to stay in the world of the living. But in the end, it was no use. While his wife was in the middle, of getting a massage from their five-star foot misuse. Sisyphus was dragged by Hermes and his winged sandals to the underworld, where a punishment worse than death awaited him. Zeus instructed Sisyphus to roll a boulder up a large mountain. If he was so clever, surely he should be able to do it. At first, Sisyphus wasn't too concerned with the task. He rolled the boulder up the hill, pulling a hamstring on the way. He had never been much for leg exercise, after all. Eating grapes on a fainting couch is much more of a triceps workout. As Sisyphus rolled the boulder up the mountain, his mind was reeling with possibilities. 
with tricks he could use to get out of this. Could he trick Zeus again? Once he got the boulder up to the top, could he somehow talk to Persephone and get himself out of Tartarus altogether? When Sisyphus reached the top of the mountain, he felt a moment of confidence. But the confidence was squashed as he watched the boulder magically roll back down to the bottom of the mountain. That's when Zeus and Hermes told him about the reality of his task. He was to spend eternity rolling the boulder up the hill, only for it to roll back down again. Sisyphus had no choice. He continued to roll the boulder up the mountain, cursing Zeus under his breath as he did so. For quite some time, he was viewed as the cleverest, deceitful king of all. But now, Sisyphus had been bested. Some say Sisyphus is still rolling the boulder up the hill to this very day. Some say he is still plotting against Zeus, trying to come up with a plan to get out of his eternal, fruitless task. Knowing Sisyphus, surely he will someday get the upper hand on Zeus. But till then, he will continue to roll the boulder up. Watch it roll down. Up then down, up, then down. I hope you have enjoyed this story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, restful sleep. Hopefully, it was boring enough to get you that one-way ticket to dreamland. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. <laughs>